America is an amazing country filled with wonderful people who do incredible things. But too often, the media and liberal politicians ignore big parts of our nation and the people who make it work. So I'm speaking with leaders and policymakers who deal with real problems every day. I'm Ronna McDaniel, and this is Real America. Today, I'm going to be speaking with George Logan, the Republican nominee for Connecticut's 5th Congressional District. We're going to cover everything from Biden's failed economic agenda to Georgia's positive vision for a more prosperous country and his family's story building their own American dream. I'm so excited to welcome George Logan to Real America. Welcome to my podcast. Thank, Thank you, you for joining me. Pleasure to be here. So we'll talk a little bit more how we met, mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to start with something that I haven't started every podcast with because everyone should know George Logan is a top candidate for the House. He is one of our top seats that we can flip to retire Nancy Pelosi in Connecticut 5. How can people support your candidacy and give money to you in your very critical race. Sure, Ron. Just go to georgeloganforcongress.com. Georgeloganforcongress.com. So everybody go do that right now and then listen to the podcast while you're donating to his campaign. Yeah. Um, I want to get to know you a little bit better. And then we'll talk about how we met um, when I was in Connecticut, which is just such, so, it was so exciting to meet you and see you on the stump. But um, your grandparents we're from Jamaica, yeah. and they went to Guatemala during the Depression in the 1930s. Can you talk a little bit about your family history and coming from Jamaica, ending ending up in Guatemala, and then coming to the United States of America? Can you tell that story? Absolutely. So three of my grandparents uh, are from uh, uh, Jamaica, one from Nicaragua, but even his roots were from Jamaica as well. Really? Yeah, in the 1930s, there was a depression right here in the United States and all over the, the, the world, really. Uh, and so they uh, people were moving around. So they received free transportation to go to Guatemala to work uh, seasonally uh, in some of the fields there, plantation fields, and they decided to, to stay. Uh, my parents uh, met each other, you know, in Guatemala. Okay. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't a ton of people of African descent in Guatemala, but they found each other, um, and they were dating. So now in the 1960s, uh, the United States, uh, we had a, a, a station, a base down in Guatemala. We did. So now my, my uncle, Vincent, uh, he was stationed in Guatemala. He worked, he was in the army. He repaired helicopters, didn't fly them, but he repaired them. And he was there for like a one year stint and he uh, fell in love with my aunt Sonia. They, yeah, they, yeah, they got uh, married. He brought her to the United States. My grandmother, now my parent, my, uh, my uh, mother and her, her siblings were older. So my grandmother came to Connecticut because he's from New Haven, Connecticut. Okay. And so then my mother followed her mother. My dad said, hey, you know what? The love of my life just went to the United States. Uh, you know, he, uh, you know, got his uh, So visa. they weren't married yet? No, they weren't he even married He followed yet. her while yes. they were dating. Yes, the story goes, you know, it, it changed over time. Sometimes he said he had $12, sometimes he had $20. Okay. But he didn't have much. 12 and 20, yes, not yes, big of a difference. Yes. Back yeah. in the mid '60s, and he uh, he flew into the United States. Called my uncle. He says, "Hey, I'm in the United States now in Guatemala. You can travel across the country by car in about 16 hours." So okay. he called and he called my uncle. He says, "Well, where are you? You know, JFK, LaGuardia." He said he looked around. He said, uh, "No, I'm in. Uh, it says Miami International Airport." So my uncle had to you know uh, rent a car, or borrow a car, drive the 24 hours, pick them up, brought them to uh, Connecticut. But you know, the story there is is that you know my um, uh, parents you know, they got married you know in Connecticut and uh, they worked. You know, my dad said he always he had two sometimes three jobs at a time he said if he uh, didn't like a job he was doing uh within a week he can find another job right really? he ended up finally working in a, a factory that's no longer there anymore but uh, american crucible it was called okay. he worked there for 17 years my mother worked as back then they called her a secretary she did that for about uh, 20 years and they raised our, our family there me and my two brothers you know always pushing uh, education and working hard and that's where i kind of got uh, kind of my mojo here in terms of what i wanted to do in life and the the, um, really understanding the importance of education and hard work and what it can do as far as the American and dream what you is can concerned. Achieve. Absolutely. So, did they? Did they love America? Are, are they still living? Or are they... my my father uh, passed away in two thousand seven. Okay. I'm so this, sorry. Yes. And uh, but my mother's still going strong. Okay. Eighty four years old. Eighty four. Yes, she is. And do they just love this country? Loved America, of course. You know, and the thing about it, when they came over here, they came with all the confidence in the world. You know that you know as far as equal opportunity, if you work hard, right?
right? You can succeed. Yeah. And I saw that, you know, growing up and I believed them. And that's why I studied so hard. I ended up um, achieving and obtaining a, a degree in engineering, yeah. right? And getting a job as an engineer, working at a water company for 30 years, you know, and then raising my fam family myself. And that's why now I'm very concerned because I'm worried that my kids, my son Hunter's 23 years old, my daughter Tracy in her senior year of college, yeah, she's 20. And I want them to be able to, you know, enjoy the American dream. Have that same opportunity. Absolutely. I just want to say, George, yeah. you do not look like you have a 23-year-old. And I, I shouldn't say that in a 20-year-old. And you don't look like you worked for 30 years. But um, you, good genes. Um, say thanks to mom. Uh, and say hi to her for me. But that's really amazing, that story. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about how we met. Because talking about your family story does intersect a little bit with how sure. you and I first met. Um, and the best part about my job mm -hmm. is I get to travel the country yes. and meet people like you. Uh -huh. And rising stars in our party. But... We were opening a black and Hispanic community center in your district. That's right. Um, Waterbury is kind of the main part of, of Connecticut 5, but we were in New Britain. Mm -hmm. And I got to see you speak, and I saw all these people come to that community center. And it was just amazing. But what I say to people all the time is these inroads we're making with Hispanic and, and other voters that have immigrated here legally— Yes. In some ways, they love our country even more because they sacrifice so much to come here. And it sounds a little bit like your story. Absolutely. And and your mom. So I love that. And my son was there and he met you. He was, you're like his number one candidate. <laughs> He's it. my son, Nash, who's 17. So you grew up in Connecticut. You you go work in the private sector. I think you were the first college graduate in your family. Sure, absolutely. Yes. Um, you're living the American dream because of the sacrifice of your family. And then you end up being a state senator. How does that happen? Well, you know, um, so my goal uh, once I graduated from college was to, you know, to get a job and to start my own family. I didn't have any lofty goals in terms of running for public office. But what I found was, uh, you know, once— uh, uh, I, I had kids, and um, you know they were in high school. And I would talk to my uh, uh, friends and colleagues. I was coaching my daughter's uh, middle school basketball team, yeah. talking to the parents, and they would talk about having to go to Florida or, or you know other states and California uh, and Seattle to visit their children. Why? Because the, the cost of living in Connecticut, remember I ran for state senate, was too high. So I took a look and I I said, boy, you know we're a state of millions of people. Why are we sending the same people to Hartford? So I decided to throw my hat in the ring because I was tired of the high high uh, property values, the high taxes, the regulations on businesses. And I ran against a 12-term incumbent, uh, right? And there, I was partly lucky because no one wanted to run against this fellow because he beat all uh, comers. But I knew that we, the Republican Party, we had the better message, right? Free enterprise, uh, family values, hard work, and I just hit it hard. And I thought it might take a couple election cycles to actually get my name recognition going, but I gave it the old college try, and I eked out a victory. And I turned oh a, a blue district red for a, a couple what year was that? Oh, that was in 2016. 2016. Yes. Yes. So you became a state senator. Yes. And what did you learn in that process, just being in Hartford and the things that you're seeing in these Democrat run states Absolutely. that are blue? Connecticut is a blue state. Like you said, the taxes are so high there. Right. What were some of the things or the challenges you faced as a state senator? So when uh, I, I won in 2016, we entered uh, in 2017, and we actually managed to pull off a tie in the Senate. We were tied in the Senate, the same number of Republicans, same number of Democrats, and we were able to do amazing things. You know, we were able to pass after 40 years of trying a um, uh, spending cap on our budget, a you know, budget cap, uh, bonding cap, all of these things because the Democrats were forced to work, you know, with us. And so between, uh, you know, the Republicans and those moderate, the Democrats that we were able to find, we managed to do some things to help shore up our, our budget in Connecticut. And actually, as a result, Connecticut's now experiencing a over $4 billion surplus. Really? Yes, because of that. And I'm telling you, the Democrats in Connecticut are trying, they've tried everything they can to find a way around and, uh, uh, you know, to break the spending cap, to break the bonding cap, borrow more than we can, and it hasn't been uh, working. So those are some of the things I'm most proud of about being in the Senate. Also, for me, it's important uh, to do what I can to work across the aisle. I found that in my district and uh, even in the state legislature, uh, there were moderate uh, uh, Democrats where the party's kind of uh, moving away from them, right? Going too far yep. to the left. They don't have a home right. almost in the, right, the Democrat party right. anymore. So in terms of uh, my, when I'm in mixed company, I talk about the moderate voters and conservative voters from Connecticut have no voice in Washington. Our entire congressional delegation in Connecticut are all far left leaning liberals. And that's a, a problem. But this is why we're getting so much momentum now uh, because we're able to show that, look, again, 
again, we have the message. The status quo is, is terrible. If you want it to change, you can't vote for the same folks you've been voting for. You can't vote for these liberal, so-called progressive Democrats. You're just going to get more of the same. And they'll take your state backwards. Excellent. And look at what's happened with just some uh, some bipartisanship yes. and putting the people of Connecticut first, especially with this, this Senate that yes. forced the Democrats to work with Republicans. You use a phrase, and uh, I'd like to talk about that because I think it touches on what you were just talking about. You you say, I want to bring radical sensibility instead of radical partisanship. Right. And I think that embodies the Democrat Party right now, radical partisanship. Absolutely. Everything is about going so far left and being so radical that we've lost common sense. But talk about that and what you want to bring to Congress. Absolutely. You hit it on the head there. You know, so the uh, left, far left leaning uh, Democrats, you know, um, they're progressive, they're radical in the wrong way. So I want to bring radical in the sensibility in the right way. And the definition for me, it is common sense, right? Yeah. Because what we're experiencing now is that, uh, you know, these excessive uh, spending packages when we're experiencing record high inflation, that's not common sense. When you want to uh, defund the police or redirect funds when the Democrats try to play with words, right? As crime Reimagine. is- Reimagine. Uh, yes, yeah. as crime is ticking up, that is not uh, common sense, right? When you have businesses, particularly in Connecticut, uh, that are, are hurting, having a hard time to expand and hire more workers, right? Because of uh, stifling, uh, you know, regulations. And what do the Democrat leaders want to do in Connecticut? Add more restrictions to businesses. That is not common sense. So when we talk about radical sensibility, that's what I'm talking about, bringing more common sense. And now at the congressional level, bringing that down to Washington, right? We need some more sensibility down in Washington. We need to work uh, uh, better together uh, uh, to move our country uh, in the right direction. People want that. Yes. They want to see us work work together and yeah. find solutions and put our focus on the people we represent. That's right. The people you're going to represent. So tell me about your district. Sure. You're running for Connecticut 5. That's right. Tell me about the people of your district and what you're hearing is your campaign. Sure. 41 towns and municipalities in the district, and we've got the whole gamut. You know, we've got our inner cities like Meriden, where I live, and Waterbury, Connecticut, New Britain, Connecticut, Danbury. Uh, we also have urban areas, uh, uh, suburban areas. We have farm uh, areas as well. So very diverse. But one common thread that we have is that we have a lot of uh, working class people, okay. right? And um, again, when you talk about the status quo, you talk about these excessive spending packages. You know, the liberal Democrats, they say, oh, you know, we're going we're to make the top 1% pay. But every time they come up with a, a plan or a scheme, what you find is, is the middle class, the working. The working class. Right? Working class are, are footing the bill. And the same is happening now with their with Green New Deal, with the um, uh, loan forgiveness plan, which the, you know, now they're trying to build sort of, they put their build back better kind of to that as well, all of these result in uh, inflation, higher prices, things being unaffordable. So the number one issue I hear in my district is affordability. Uh, things are just too expensive, whether it's groceries, whether it's gas, even baby formula is still an issue. And those are things that uh, folks in my district and are And rent on. too, and yes. rent and insurance. I mean, every single thing, right. my mom said this when I got married and we got our first apartment. Yeah. She said it's it's death by a thousand cuts, right? Right. right. It, well, you got to go buy new dishes and new pots and pans and flour and sugar and things for your house, and it gets so expensive it adds up. So when gas is two dollars more or rent is this much more right. or insurance, it takes such a toll on a working class family. I want to circle back on one of the things you talked about, which is the student loan forgiveness. Yes. You said your district is made up of primarily working class voters. That's correct. What do they think about the fact that? With this Biden administration, what they just did is said, we are going to bail out Harvard and Yale and all these people who made a contract. That's right. They willingly accepted these loans. Right. They're making significant amount of money. That's right. And now you, somebody who maybe paid off your college or went to a technical college or community college or right. um, or didn't go to college at all— right. You're going to have to pay off their college loans. What do, what do voters think about that in your district? They feel like it's a slap in their face. We have so many folks who've paid off their student loans. We have so many who made choices, right, to go to community college or to not to go to college at all, right, and enter into the trades. They made these decisions. And now, on top of that, you're asking them to foot the bill. And look, this is not a long-term solution. You know, no. The government cannot continue to just forgive uh, student uh, loans. So, you know, we need to uh, work more. You know, I think the, the, uh, the government, you know, being so involved in the stu you know, student loans uh, is something that, you know, we need to encourage more uh, private uh, sector involvement in it. Because 
This is what happens. And now we've got a situation where there are people that are upset in my district, you know, but they're going to show out in the, on, on November 8th. And they're going to come and they're going to vote our way. And we're going to replace the incumbent congresswoman, John Hayes, who's voted 100 percent in line with all these bad, bad policies that President Biden and Nancy Pelosi has pushed forward. Oh, I, I'm so excited. I think you're exactly right. And the other thing is, you're, it's not a long-term solution. And this is the thing that the Democrats are all about band-aids, right? right. A quick fix. Right. Because if you really want to tackle uh, student loans and the high cost of tuition, go after the universities. That's right. That's why right. don't you go after these universities that have huge endowments? That's right. And why don't you put pressure on them to stop raising the price on our kids and making college unaffordable? Unaffor- but they don't do that. You know why? Because those are their friends, That's right? That's exactly right. So they'd rather put it on the back of working class voters. And I'm so glad to hear that you're talking about that in your district. Um, you were also a a basketball coach. Yes. You worked with the YMCA. Yeah. Just somebody who gives back so much to the community. What are you seeing with kids right now, especially in Connecticut? And I, I'm seeing this in Michigan too who dealt with the pandemic and the deficits of education right. that we're seeing in the aftermath of the teachers' unions and the Democrat Party closing our kids out of this, the classroom. Yes. Well, first of all, the pandemic and the extended lockdowns uh, have really hurt our students in terms of their um, um, educational ability and levels, in terms of uh, you know, mental health and awareness you know, as well. Absolutely. Uh, is uh, totally uh, uh, an issue. And now parents have, are now paying more attention to what their kids are being taught in school. Now they're realizing that they're boxed out of their child's education. It's a, it's a huge problem. Look, uh, Democrats in Connecticut have been contr- in control of our educational system at na- a national level as well, one party rule. And look what it's gotten us, right? In Connecticut, uh, particularly in our urban areas, uh, reading comprehension scores at, at, are at a nearly critical level. We need to focus and get back to basics, math, reading, uh, um, um, you know, comprehension. Uh, we've got a, uh, the arts, sports, teamwork, all those sorts of things. But right now, you know, the Democrats who are in charge of education system, they're trying to uh, teach our, our, our kids what they want, right? Politi- uh, um, uh, political uh, indoctrination. We need to focus on the basics. Take that out of there. Show children, uh, you know, how to learn, you know, but not what to learn. I love and that, that is the problem that we have currently, at least in, in the 5th Congressional uh, District. What can you do about that in Congress? What can right. you do when you get elected to help push back on what the Democrats are doing? I am so disgusted by this, by the way. I'm so upset. We, we, we just saw a study that nine-year-olds are now at a 30-year low in math and reading. Yeah, it's terrible. We just saw chronic absenteeism is up. We've seen huge mental health issues with young women going to the hospital with more self-harm cases yes, than we've had. It's yes. a 51% increase in that. I mean, these are facts, yeah, okay? Right. okay? And Democrats know this happened. They know it happened under their watch. That's right. And you know what they did about it? They said, instead of showing up our kids that we just left behind, we're going to go pay off college loans. Can you imagine? For kids who can afford it, who have good jobs, who are doing fine, because you know what? They can vote because right. a kindergartner can't. It's disgusting. It is. So what do you— what can you do in Congress right. to help these kids who have been so left behind? And there are solutions to this education problem, and right? And just spending money is not the solution. Because look, they're trying to spend uh, money now. It's not filtering down to our students. There are solutions. One, uh, school uh, choice. I believe that uh, parents know best, and they should be able to— I like the, the idea of the money following the child, and yep. the parents deciding where their child is best to go to school. I believe that will actually help the public education system because now the public schools will be competing with private schools or, or charter schools or magnet schools and even parochial schools, uh, um, and I think it, that will benefit the, uh, the children. We need to focus on the uh, children, not the uh, institution of, uh, of education, uh, and that will do the trick. Also, let's take a look at—we uh, talk about student uh, college loans. What about the trades in— in my district, the 5th Congressional District, manufacturing. We have lots of manufacturing uh, companies. I've toured them numerous times, and they're looking for skilled workers, right? So we need to encourage you. Look, I've met uh, young people who have started off at, with uh, apprenticeships while they're in high school. Yep. They go into these so manufacturing. True. They're 22, 23 years old. They're making 60000 70000 years. No student loans. So look, I, you know, I went to college. I'm all for a college, right? But college isn't for everyone. So there are different avenues that we can go, and I think we need to focus on that. 
But right now what we have from the Democrat leadership in Washington, they're just totally misguided. Uh, Look, when your focus is just to stay in power, right, you don't run the shop well. And that's what's happening uh, right now. And our students are suffering. So I want to go to Washington, point these things out. School choice, one of my uh, uh, municipalities, uh, Danbury, they have a, a program that's called LEAD program. Okay. Uh, and there they're, uh, they're pushing their own, their own school. They're trying to push uh, 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 you know, uh, school choice. Um, but they're getting fr- uh, friction. Right. From the Democrat leadership in Connecticut. You know, so I think at the federal level, I think we need to uh, push uh, more solutions that are going on that vein. Uh, And the way we do that is one. We uh, flip the House of Representatives. Yep. We get rid of Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House because we know that she is not going to fix the education system because she hasn't to date, right? And then we bring some better checks and balances to the Biden-Harris administration until we get to 2024 and we can get a more conservative Republican president in office. I like the way you think. I like the way you think. So education is a big issue. Yeah. We talked about the economy. What about crime? Is crime an issue in your district? Crime is a huge issue in my district. There has been an uptick in crime since the time I was in the uh, state Senate, and I voted against what I call the, uh, in Connecticut, the anti-police bill uh, that was passed. Um, and what that did, it uh, it weakened our, uh, the ability of our police officers in Connecticut um, to uh, really you know, apprehend criminals, um, repeat offenders are being let out of jail, you know, uh, and what's what's happening? is more carjackings. People are being robbed in broad daylight. Uh, Our communities are less safe, right, with these defund the police or as uh, the incumbent uh, uh, Congressman Hayes calls, redirection of funds. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. And so despite all of that, they still go down that path. You know, my incumbent, she was uh, uh, been endorsed uh, by, um, uh, it's called the Working Families Party uh, of Connecticut. And this is an organization whose main, one of their main goals is to defund the police. So goes to Washington, votes in line with Nancy Pelosi uh, nearly 100% of the time, uh, votes in line with AOC nearly 100% of the time, the Biden-Harris administration, uh, does all these bad things that are really uh, making us uh, weak in terms of our, our police force and our law enforcement, then she comes back and says that she supports law enforcement. It's just, you know, and President Biden's doing the same thing as well. Right? See, so there's words right. and they're, they're words that are lies. That's right. And then your actions show us where your true beliefs are. Exactly. And they are absolutely for defunding the police. No Because otherwise about. they would be fighting cashless bail and getting these criminals back on the streets. They have become the criminal party. They really have. And our cities are less safe. And I want to just touch back on the community center we open. Absolutely. Because... Democrats have had the historic wins with minority voters for so long, Black, Asian, Hispanic. Uh, And the RNC, and and you were there, we are really trying to make inroads with with these communities. But I think we have to point out, on crime, they're failing these communities. That's right. On education, you know how many kids didn't show up to school right. in, in the last year? Over a million kids, K through wow. 12, and wow. mostly in urban minority communities, are being left behind right. because of Democrat policies. So... What are you seeing? And and as a as a as somebody who represents um, the minority community, what do you say to people as to why you're Republican and why minority voters should start looking to our party for solutions? Yeah. So first of all, I got to tell you, want to thank you, the RNC, the uh, community center that you opened up uh, in New Britain has been huge. It's been a, an amazing asset to the operations of my campaign and other republics in Connecticut. I love hearing that. Oh, absolutely. You know, we have been bringing in uh, Hispanic uh, uh, constituents that have been coming in, uh, registering to vote for the first time, uh, wanting to volunteer and to help out. Uh, we have helped out uh, with programs with Black uh, History Month, Uh, Asian Pacific Americans, we've had a program, Uh, jam-packed, you know, room, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just been, it's been wonderful. So the uh, Hispanic uh, population, the minority population, uh, they're looking for an alternative and we provide that alternative for them. And the community, RNC Community Center has, again, has been a a huge asset, incredibly uh, helpful. And the community sees that now Republicans are paying attention, right, to the inner cities, to the urban areas in a way that we haven't in the past. Now, look, I tell folks the message that we have, it's the same message, right? Equal opportunity, right? Free enterprise, family values. But the difference is we're actually going into these yeah. urban communities. We're going into the Hispanic communities. Now, look, I'm bilingual. My, so my parents are from Guatemala, but I am uh, bilingual as well. And that's also a huge asset as well. I can go in there and I can uh, you know, speak to folks. Um, you know, I tell folks, yo soy Latino como tú. You know, we're, we're all Latinos. We're all Americans. We, you know, we're trying to you know, get, uh, move our country in a better direction, but we need to do it together. You know, uh, together we will succeed. And look, I've got a track record. 
with the state senate. I'm from the community. You know, you talk about my mother, my 84-year-old mother. She's a great asset to my campaign as well. I'm sure she oh, is. Oh, people it, what's love her. her. What's her name? Olga Taylor Logan. I love she's Olga. She's got her Facebook. Oh, she posts on there. She went to go visit her 89-year-old uh, sister in Guatemala just a couple of uh, weeks ago, and she posted a, um, uh, did a post of her uh, dancing, 84 years old dancing. Oh, my oh, gosh. Yes, I, I love tell Olga. You. So, oh. Yes, yes. So she's, you know, she's been great she's as well. She's got to be out there so much. She's my you. biggest But you're, you, are you seeing the movement and the energy? Because, you know, when I was at that community center opening, yes. it was packed. Right. It was packed. That's right. And I think there is a hunger, like you said, for something else. Because Democrats have continuously taken minority votes for right. granted. That's right. They just assume. And, but the, here's the, the next part of it. Yeah. They take the votes for granted, yeah. and then they do not deliver results. That's right. Schools False aren't promises. better. Right. Crime is up. Right. Across the country, right. edu- we have these education deficits. It is just wrong, and right. they are full of it. Agreed. And so finally, people like you are stepping up, and we're, we're backing you 100%. Yes. But when, when I say to voters, you're better off having a voice in both parties because then they have to deliver. That's right. And it's time to look at the Republican Party. But do you feel the movement? Do you Abs- see it happening? Absolutely. Look, and the polls show it. That's why I mean, some polls are saying we're at a toss-up now, right? Yep. And the reason why is because we are getting into the district, we're getting into the urban areas and the suburban areas and the rural areas with our message. Folks are seeing that the Democrats continuously provide these false promises that really have, has only made the affordability issue worse, has made the inflation issue worse. Uh, education, right, is still in a trajectory downward. And you just, you, folks just understand, you cannot change the status quo by voting these same folks back in office. And the incumbent, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes, has been doing a terrible job for Connecticut, has not been a voice for the 5th Congressional District. As you can tell, I like to talk. I got a lot to say. I'm going to be a loud voice down in Washington working with the current leadership in, in, in Washington, working with yeah. moderate Democrats that, you know, want to solve our, help solve our common problems, and we can turn this country around. It's up to each and every one of us. Our vote is the most powerful, right, to get things the way we want them to be. Well, I love that, and I think you're exact. I mean, you've proven that you can work in a bipartisan way in the state Senate. You understand the issues facing your district because I know you're working so hard. But how can anybody understand people in your district when they're voting with Biden 100% of the exactly, time? I'm sorry. Exactly. Biden's a disaster, exactly. and he's been a disaster exactly. for working class Americans. So I, I'm just going to end with one final fun question um, or more of a personal question. Sure. But I know, you know, your grandparents came from, uh, went to, from Jamaica to Gu- Guatemala. Mm-hmm. Your parents came here. Your dad followed your mom. Mm-hmm. You're living the American dream. What do you say to people who don't feel like it's important to vote? or that th- they can't make a difference with their one vote in this election. Mm-hmm. What do you say to motivate them and and about the greatness of this country and why you're working so hard to be in this so important role? Right. We're going to win this election. It's going to be a close one, right? Yeah. I give uh, an example of my state Senate run. The first time I ran, about 36,000 people voted. I won by less than 900 votes. Wow. My uh, re-election, about 38,000 people voted in that election. I won by less than 100 votes. Oh, my god. This goodness. is going to be a close election. We're going to win. I need two things. I need people to get out and actually vote, and I need to have the resources to be able to get my message out because they, the opposition, they are— They're, they're, they're already, spending lots of money. Uh, lots of money with uh, uh, false and blatant lies and negative ads, and I need to make sure that I can get my message out in terms of my record or what I want to do. And that's what's so important. So how do we do it? GeorgeLogan.com? GeorgeLoganForCongress.com. GeorgeLoganForCongress.com. I am so excited about you. You are one of our rising stars in our party. Thank you for all that you do, all that you have done. And I look forward to calling you congressman after November. Thank Thank you, George. Thank you for the support and for this opportunity. I'm Ronna McDaniel, and this is what Republicans stand for. Join us next time on Real America.